I think so. As usual, we are a little behind. If you come from PowerPoint, it actually makes you work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember you from Chicago. I think you were in this great house. Yes, probably anything else you guys are so excited about to hear what the food is. I've been kind of agitating about it. Okay. Just when you were holding that session, I was really sorry not to be here on Friday. No, no worries. So, um, I mean, for myself went in there to actually ask, okay, but actually the status, what's going on? Because kind of my responsibility shifted into this direction. So, I'm partly taking over what Dirk also. Has well, then been we doing. really should talk. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, I had some ideas on yeah, that we maybe um, there is this graph which is actually quite good uh, from. <laughs> Oh, okay. 
one that was with the yeah, problem statement, it's in background on, on your list. Is it what in thing have. to thing or is it It's in thing to thing. The problem is they didn't, they didn't submit it specifically to thing to thing. So it's kind of for them. Yeah, exactly. But um, so they, when they submitted the, the first version, it was kind of mm -hmm. where this work should, should happen. But they said, uh, so it's interesting. And there has been some positive feedback uh, from some American guys, yes. for instance. In particular, for the industrial okay, use case of IoT. So did you look at all the other stuff that's been in the Yes, so, um, okay, the data overview. So you had this gap analysis of the work. Okay, so, however, this is the document. It was more the slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, maybe you can then actually help. Can get you the document? Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, so, um, what gets presented today? Maybe we'll be sending to the other side. It was I think it was presented to you, and then there was a mm -hmm. beyond damage confusing Yeah, that I also <laughs> saw there was no activity, but um, so I, I heard um, about this activity. So uh, since I'm with Huawei now, uh, people pointed me to this. I looked into this and I asked, uh, might I make it right? Yes, but what's interesting is that I attended his session, right? mm -hmm. and then as a result, Told him that I thought that the problem of edge data discovery mm -hmm. and edge data management. I saw this important. document. Yeah. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so I did like a serious class on it in the second version, so I did mm -hmm. um, So I feel like those are some kinds of problems that people can eventuate. And it mm -hmm. isn't attached to the work that we're either, mm -hmm. just because I'm now part of the point of okay. yeah. stuff, we're going to present it there, but mm -hmm. it isn't even presented mm -hmm. to the yeah. part of the edge. Anyway, they're all just Yeah, that, that's what they're I'm trying to figure out, like, exactly. exactly how to... And Kuno G is a spin-off of this, so... Okay, yeah. do you see it like this? Well, I think that's what happened. Uh, last time it was a breakout session from the thing to thing working group. Yeah, but it was really organized as a coin uh, group. We then actually hijacked it from the thing to thing group oh, because really? they also do edge computing related, so we should huh. listen to what they are doing. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of yeah, okay. that's, but that's how I learned about this connectivity. So okay. Good thing. Yeah. But yeah, it would be great to hear what you do with the network Or is it getting some other so, names? So, mm, so what I was uh, hinting at was that we have kind of this thing-centric uh, view. So you a small device and then we look for some service, which could be some compute node, maybe a storage uh, possibility for you as a constraint node. So this approach, opposed to if we have network infrastructure and we can facilitate more. Mm -hmm. So this is actually something I also want to understand, and which was also discussed on the mailing list, like where does it go? Is it really now yeah. application logic and switches or? Yes, yes, it's a big conundrum. You know, how, how much are they the same and how much are they different? And depending on where you live in that spectrum of data center to somewhere closer yeah. to the device, what should that network element do? Mm -hmm. And if it facilitates the queue, what kind of compute? Is it switching compute? Is it routing compute? Is it, is it AI? Is it encryption? You know, so mm -hmm. they're, yeah, so we're trying to decompose them and mm -hmm. be systematic. Yeah, over you already. Yeah, okay. I guess when they say we're going to start. <laughs> I don't think it's us. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so some of that will come yeah. out of the coin. I mean, I only asked for five minutes, so don't expect too much. Yeah, on a bit of different thing, but of course, it's also somehow related. So nice. It's this uh, web of things where we do in W3C, which yeah, we are about to wrap up for the first iteration. So making the first standards available, that's maybe cool. better cool. phrasing. Yeah, no, um, so Michael McCool yeah, is exactly. someone who I interact with a lot. Mm -hmm. I okay, so yeah, and he's uh, and Michael we'll Shared. Why is everything I'm trying, <laughs> bro?
and stuff. Okay, go ahead. Okay, welcome everyone to Think Think Research Group meeting. And sorry for the delay. There's a bunch of technical problems, apparently with the network. So, <laughs> so shouldn't be expecting to download files large and large than one megabyte over over the network today. So as usual, we are at the IETF, the IRTF meetings. Note well applies. You are being uh, recorded, and the usual IPR guidelines do apply. Uh, we will be sending pink sheets shortly uh, once we get get them signed up. Um, we'd like to get a volunteer extra note taker. So if someone can, uh, I'll be also taking notes on the Etherpad, so you don't have to do it alone. But I'll be also doing some talking, uh, so it would be good for someone to help on the Etherpad. The Etherpad link uh, is on the GitHub uh, repo, so you'll, you'll find it from there. Okay, excellent. Thanks, George. The agenda for today, uh, we will give you a, a very brief intro and RG status in, in the beginning, and then we will give a report uh, from some of the recent activities uh, in the WISHI, uh, in the pre-work meeting we had on Friday, and also from the hackathon. Then we have Michael Koster joining remotely to present the W3C Community Group uh, schema extensions. Uh, Matthias will give an update on the Web of Things group. And then uh, Klaus will give us um, a presentation and, and we have a, some time for discussion on using Coral to bring more hypermedia to IoT. And finally, Christian Amsus will be presenting research directory replication. Any questions or comments on the agenda? Okay, so we have a, a Coral site meeting upcoming. Uh, it's on, on Wednesday, uh, 3 to 5 p.m. in room Tiroka. Uh, Klaus will be, will be uh, drive, driving that. Uh, the usual, what are we doing in Tintin Research Group? What is our scope and goals? Uh, we are looking into these open research issues, how we can really turn the IoT that we are working on in, into reality. We are focusing here on things that there is opportunities for IETF standardization, You're basically starting with the IP layer, going all the way up to the application layer and, and APIs. Often we get a question, so what is the relationship between the uh, IRTF thinking research group and all the IETF, uh, IoT work? So, of course, there is a lot of overlap on the topics uh, where we are looking into, in particular uh, with core and, and Elwick working groups. So as you know, El Elwick is giving this informational guidance for implementers, how you can actually implement IoT on the constraint space. And in core, we are doing a lot of protocol engineering uh, for the restful in environments. So thinking RG is, is mainly looking on those things that are still falling outside of the scope of these groups and, and the other, uh, other IoT-related groups. And, and looking how we can be extending the areas uh, where we can make an impact, but then doing also work together with these uh, research groups, and also with these working groups, and occasionally we are handing off work uh, from the research group to the working groups, but on the other hand, sometimes we discover group uh, work in the working groups, which falls outside of their area today and can be, for example, discussed here. Some recent activities where we have been involved, um, we've been driving this work on IoT semantic hypermedia interoperability called WISHI. That was started two years ago here in Prague in the, in the original WISHI workshop. And then we have had a lot of virtual meetings and a bunch of hackathons. Actually had the fifth hackathon uh, this time here at this IETF. Also, we had a WebEx session with the OMA Specworks. Uh, similar sessions we have had with OCF earlier, earlier on about aligning the use of IETF technologies and with uh, OMA spec work technology, in particular, like with them doing protocol and the IPSO models. Also, uh, we had a work meeting this Friday before the IETF week here in Prague. Next meetings, we are planning to continue the wish calls, uh, most likely some, someday around May. Uh, usually, it will be monthly or bi-weekly basis. 
Uh, there is still work to be done together with OCF, so we'd like to have more virtual meetings with them. Likewise with OMA Specworks, with whom we had the first meeting for some time before this IETF. There is going to be a W3C Web of Things workshop happening in, in June. Matthias will tell a bit more about that. But there's also likely good collaboration with the things in Archie and, and other organizations. And then, of course, at the next IETF in, in Montreal, um, we're planning to have a, get again a wishy hackathon on the weekend before. And there's also potential to have a joint meeting uh, with the OMA spec work. So OMA is meeting the week, week before in Montreal. So potentially uh, on the Friday, we could have a face-to-face -face activity together with, with OMA. Also, we have had this long-standing uh, desire to have more academic uh, involvement in, in the group. So we are looking for potential co-location academic conferences uh, during this year. If you have any good ideas on that, um, please do approach the chairs. We're more than happy to discuss with you. The document status. Um, the state of the art challenges for the IoT security is currently in the RFC editor queue. So that will be the first RFC we'll publish any day now. It's actually on the top of the queue. So we expect that to be ready very soon. We also have another research group document, RESTful Design for IoT. I will have a bit more details in the upcoming slides on that. We have also a bunch of documents we've been discussing, in particular on, on the Friday meeting that we could be taking on as, as a research group topics. Uh, there has been quite a lot of work uh, done on the Edge and IO team, so having a research group document on that could make a lot of sense. On core applications and on the whole coral ecosystem, if, if you wish, some part of that work would make a lot of sense to do here in the Archie. Some of that has to be done in the working group where it's standardization work, but then the more explorative parts, uh, for example, application descriptions are very much related to this uh, RESTful design for IoT work that we have here. So we've been discussing about having a, a group of documents around that space. And the, for example, one part uh, from the core interfaces draft that is, has been in, in the uh, core working group could become actually an, an RG document giving guidance how, how you work on this environment. Also, there's a bunch of other documents where you can have a look at the Friday meeting notes for more details. One topic we discussed then was this layer three considerations. I have another more detailed slide then on upcoming. We could make uh, some document out of that. And in the WISI work, we have been making a set of what we call WISI notes. Uh, right now, a set of informal uh, wiki pages, but turning some of those potentially into RG documents longer term would be the right way to go. So for RESTful Design, um, the next steps that we are planning for the RESTful Design draft is uh, adding new terminology. I have next slide on more details. But then also we've been discussed, it would be great to get some more practical experience for building IoT systems uh, involved there. So if, if you are involved in building a, a IoT system and you have some experience you'd like to share, we'd be more than happy to talk with you and get some of that guidance in, in part to document. How can you in in practice build RESTful-based IoT systems. Also, we're planning to get more reviews uh, also outside of this group, but of course, all the reviews in this group are more than welcome. And we have a, perhaps now, a ambitious goal for getting ready for publication rather soon, perhaps even next IETF. So I mentioned about some additions to the terminology. We are planning for two new terms there, a transfer protocol and transfer layer. And actually these are not really any new terms. We've been using this uh, in the core work of the research group probably up to a decade already now. But it turns out we never formally defined what do we mean by a, a transfer protocol or, or transfer layer. Some examples that we'll be referring to these protocols is especially co-op and all versions of HTTP, so our, our RESTful suite of, of protocols. But also other protocols that you could use in, in an IoT system, like AMQP, MQTT, XMPP, for example, they all have kind of these similar characteristics uh, that you could describe as, as a transfer protocol. So we have now drafted two early draft definitions. I would very much like your input and feedback on, on these. You can read them on the slides, but they basically for transfer protocols, 
And this here we're now discussing in particular IoT domain because the draft is about restful IoT. But the transport of course would be protocols about transport la transport layer that are used to transfer data objects and provide semantics for operations on the data. The key thing is that you are transferring some sort of data objects be between between systems and you provide some additional semantics. But these protocols are reusable and often even to some extent uh, replaceable. So it's not a that tightly bound part of alpha protocol stack, but actually a, a, a maybe even a distinct layer. And for the layer part, what we are being drafted as a definition is this reusable part of the application protocol that is used to transfer the application specific data items using a standard set of methods that fulfill application specific operations. So here are the definitions we are planning for that here. Is there any instant reactions or comments on these definitions? So do people recognize that you've been using this or, or seeing this being, being used? I see some little bit of nodding in, in the audience. So at, at least in the context where I have ended up quite often, when you see that there's um, you have a, you're building an application and then you are underneath have a set of choice for protocols, having having a term to describe what is that thing that is traditionally part of the application layer of, of our stack, but it has has kind of a reusable characteristics and even potential for replacing protocols across seem to be very useful. That's why we think it's a good idea to have that part here. But if you have recommendations on how should we perhaps tweak those, um, tweak those terms, or should we rename them something else, those would be very much welcome. Then moving on, um, in the, in the WC work, what we have had so far is uh, six online meetings since the last IETF. We have been discussing a, a set of topics. Uh, we started with the Splot object model. It's a, a, a new IoT object model explorative from, from Robert from Google. We have been discussing the work is happening in the schema org on the IoT extensions. We have had quite a few meetings on this topic of best practices for data model component reusability. It's a topic we also discussed on, on, on the Friday, Friday meeting, and I have more details coming on that. And also, how in general can we go about adding semantics to ex existing instances of data? So if you have data that doesn't have machine readable semantics when you're consuming it, how can you apply after the fact some different ways of getting those semantics in order to do, for example, translation between uh, different models? And a topic very much related to this one is of this parsing and translating binary data. Uh, in particular coming, coming from legacy sources. If you can apply semantics to it, it becomes much more simpler to handle the data in the rest of the pipeline. And finally, one example of a topic that was originally discussed in the core working group, but then we realized there's perhaps more wider research aspects, is this exposing more structured media types in hypermedia exchanges. So in core working group, there is this draft on, on expressing multiple media types in, within a, a, a single media type. And we were discussing that in core, we realized, okay, this actually may have much wider implications than just for the draft that was discussed in the core. So then that was discussed in, in, in the WISI working group, like what are the perhaps wider, longer term implications, or do we have new design patterns here that we should perhaps be more explorative on? Then we also had the WISI Hackathon. That was the uh, weekend before the IETF. This was the fifth one, and we had actually 12 participants and, and, and a few more e extras occasionally showing up. And we had also one remote participant. And in this WISI Hackathon, we had the, roughly on a high level the same goal of connecting things from different ecosystems. And we are using hypermedia and, and shared semantics as the tools to achieve that. But this time we had a um, slightly more different approach. We had a lot of work done around Coral. So some of the things that we did achieve, we have now it is a new parser for, for text form of Coral. It's already published as open source as, as, as a Ruby gem. 
There is also now a, a basic coral encoder and parser and a serial mo module for the Riot operating systems. And you have links there on, on, on the slides for more details. We work quite a bit on coral examples and use cases to get, get more practical experience on like how would these things look in practice. And also, we have been using quite a bit uh, the Web of Things, uh, W3C Web of Things thing description format. Uh, and they are related formats, but slightly taking a different angle on, on, on the similar approach. And we were looking into ways to be doing translation between the two. Also, there's a Python implementation from Christian Amsus that is able to do Coral. It was now augmented here to support the latest version of Coral and also able to do visualization of Coral. And one example of that you can see on, on, on the slide on, on the lower right corner. We've also been improving some of the research directory implementations during the hackathon. And also, we did, in, um, we did update our LiveWith m to mtd generator so we can generate thing descriptions for like with m to m to conform the latest thing description format. Some of the things that we learned over the weekend, it seems to be Coral is working, uh, especially with using for resource discovery, but also beyond. And one experience that was that the, these hackathons are very useful for getting the implementation and testing guidance, in particular on, on Coral this time, since we had people who are actually defining Coral and multiple implementers over the same table you get a lot of good feedback on, on the approaches on both sides. And also, it seems we are now getting better ideas on how all this should be integrated together to actually achieve interoperability. Then quick update on the Friday work meeting. We had a full day meeting with a half a dozen different topics. We started with the data, com data model component reusability discussions. For example, discussed the vocabulary definitions and, and what kind of term mappings we do need there. Uh, terms we're discussing for affordances, traits, resources, objects, etc. Uh, different models use slightly kind of different terms. How do these uh, fit together and how can we use those to go actually across different models? Some con one con conclusion was that we do need tools that we can use to describe these data models. And it also seems to be need for language that is independent uh, from, from the transport. And this common metamodel language that Michael will be uh, discussing a bit later is one example of that. And also, there are a lot of choices what you have to do when you design these data models, in particular, how fixed or dynamic features should the data models have. And in, we did manage to gather a bit of guidance on that, but maybe getting a bit more formal, writing a wishy note on that, or even a, a research group RFC could, could be very helpful. And finally, since we've been focusing quite a bit on, on hypermedia in this work, we discussed like, how do you actually expose these things uh, at hypermedia on different levels. Speaking of hypermedia, uh, well, one topic was using Cora to bring more hypermedia to IoT. Uh, one observation we had to, is that the Coral today comes without batteries. You need a bit more to actually build your application on it. So we should perhaps start building some of those aspects to make it more easy to use in, in, in real use cases. One thing was this common composable vocabulary, in particular link relation types that, that could be defined, and also tools um, around Coral. One tool, for example, was this TD and, and between Coral transformations. We did discover that this whole topic of authorizations, like who is allowed to say what and, and where and when, when it comes to link relations and how we can, for example, use this in RD seems to be a very interesting topic to explore more. And also, Coral Complex, Coral is a very simple format, but of course, the more features you add, the more complexity you add there. And one interesting design goal when it comes to link format was that you cannot have it only in ROM. And that's what we call aromability. And, and how much of that can you have with Coral in what kind of uh, boundary conditions? Seems to be an interesting area to explore more. We also discussed this common metamodel language, which is basically an abstraction uh, between having expressive powers to have high fidelity details of different models. And the idea is that when you have this meta model, you can have different ecosystems mapping the same model, and with that, you can achieve interoperability. But you can also describe this uh, common model using the meta model. 
And then when you go to concrete implementations from different organizations, for example, you can use protocol bindings and semantic annotations to achieve that. One good observation on this kind of models was that we really need to make this usable for domain experts because oftentimes when these models would be described by a language, it is someone who may not have uh, years of IETF or, or data model background, but actually has domain expertise, for example, in agriculture or, or, or smart metering. So instead of showing a what we call a core dump, uh, perhaps something more human-friendly language is, is, is an important uh, design consideration. <laughs> We had a whole session on, on security. Um, there is already one draft, a uh, new draft on that, enabling network access for IoT devices from the cloud, currently an individual submission, but something we could consider as an RG document. Also, what we were discussing is that it would be very good to document some of those success factors and lessons that we have learned from different sec security mechanisms in this area. For example, why EAP has been rather successful in, in its own area. And also when it comes to the security work uh, outside of the uh, team thing RG, but within IETF, like if we can come up with specific requirements, especially on the constrained IoT, for example, for new crypto, that would be very, very helpful for the rest of the community. Edge and IoT has been a very popular topic uh, in Dinutin RG on over, over years already. And this is something that also CoinRG and DinRG are, are working on on various aspects. We've been looking mostly on, on the IoT specifics on this, but there seems to be a lot of interesting work to be done together with CoinRG and DinRG. But the question here was how we get the thing centric view uh, to edge computing. We also discussed this, um, some called beyond edge, edge and even abyss computing was one term that was raised during the session. And also, what kind of instances today do we have of these in-network resources and, and computing? And for example, Pubsa Broker was raised as one instance of that. And do we have already in the core infrastructure some examples of storing uh, some of your representations in, in the network and having network infrastructure helping you? We did conclude that yes, also in this area, we're gonna need more terminology. And even though we might not be ready today to make the, the architecture for, for Edge and IoT, some fragments of that architecture and, and, and more terminals around that is likely to be, be very useful. There is a individual submission with RG already on the IoT integrated with Edge computing. Uh, we concluded that that's perhaps a good way to um, continue with our collaboration and, and ex extending on that and perhaps considering later adopting as an RG document. There was also one spin-off topic from this whole edge and, and IoT, which was this industrial IoT. So of course the industrial side has a lot of commonalities with, with the other areas, but it also has some specific requirements, for example, on the criticality of, 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 of different operations. So what is, what is that piece that is, is different in industrial area and how, how to explore that was one, one thing that we highlighted. And finally, uh, something we didn't have in the agenda originally, but what uh, Ted Lemon raised up as an potentially interesting topic is this layer three considerations and what Ted called thing to thing, end to end. So it seems that there are quite a few challenges still when it comes to routing and, and, and reachability. When you are connecting constraint node networks, such as thread networks, with each other over, over, over a LAN, for example, a home network. So things as of today just don't happen automatically, but you do need some infrastructure management, for example, the home network control protocol. Also, there are challenges when it comes to discovery. We did discuss that we have quite a lot of um, tools on this in the core, core setup, for example, resource directory. But then you also run into challenges, how do you actually find your resource directory, in, in particular in this kind of heterogeneous environment. Also on the security side, uh, for example, isolation control and sworn uh, was one of the mechanisms that uh, were highlighted could be helping here. But overall, the conclusion was that we should, someone should probably implement all this and, and really see where, where are the gaps. We do think we have a good set of tools available, but do they actually fit in practice as well together as we think? Probably some good implementation work would be very helpful here. Okay, that was the report from the various thing-to-thing -thing research group 
activities so far. Is there any questions or comments on this before we go for Michael's presentation? Okay, seems we don't have Michael yet online. He is currently attending another meeting, so we may have some challenges finding the common slots. So perhaps while waiting for Michael to join, we could take the W3C Web of Things update first. And on all of these topics that, that we have, uh, highlighted here very briefly. If you're interested in working on any of these, please do join. Uh, you can ask from us chairs what's the right place, uh, who, who to contact to actually start the work on these. Okay, excellent. I, I need to. So, so. Okay, everyone ready? Yeah. Good. Yeah, so this is another update uh, of this uh, yeah, collaboration with the W3C where we have the Web of Things activity. Uh, main part of the work is happening in the working group at the moment. As a quick reminder, uh, this is uh, the big picture of what we are working on. So uh, what we have is a big umbrella document about the what architecture. And uh, there we basically describe Blue sheets are coming. Uh, there we describe uh, how the building blocks that we are standardizing fit together. So the overall idea is that we do not define a complete vertical solution that now everyone has to implement, but uh, we look at standards that complement what is already out there and help uh, the interoperability and the integration of these individual uh, systems already out there. And a key part of this is the so-called uh, thing description. So it's a document format that allows you to learn what uh, a thing provides. Uh, so it has general metadata. It has uh, what we now concluded on calling affordances um, to be aligned with the hypermedia work. And uh, it also includes then the protocol bindings. So you can uh, figure out in a uniform format what protocol is used, what tweaks has, have been applied to this protocol, and so on. And uh, we have a central interaction model to simplify, um, to uh, connect this with applications. So um, we have properties to encapsulate data, to have um, basically status ex exposed by, by things. We have actions to trigger physical processes on the things that might run for a certain time. And we have events uh, to support these uh, asynchronous notifications that you might receive by a thing. And uh, we then have, in addition, the scripting API. So this was work on defining a common runtime, a bit sim or similar to, to the web browser, where uh, you have a common, common runtime to define web applications, but this now transferred to the IoT, where it's more about uh, automation tasks, orchestration that would uh, run in the background, but still against the standard API uh, for communication and so on. And uh, the last document uh, down here is the binding templates. This is basically a document that helps you to define your thing descriptions. They can look up um, how you would describe an existing device, for instance, uh, of the OCF ecosystem, of uh, lightweight M2M ecosystem, and so on. So it um, is an explainer document uh, to the central thing description. Um, and uh, we are now uh, close to completing this work on the first sets of building blocks. Um, here, the picture is now as follows. The architecture document and the thing description are recommendation track documents. So in W3C speak, that means those will become standards. And uh, the scripting API, unfortunately, was downgraded to a working group node. That means um, all the work, all the findings that we have are still covered in a document, we will officially publish this document, but it's not normative. Uh, the reason for this was that uh, kind of the interest of uh, implementing this and gaining experience hands-on uh, decre uh, de decreased, unfortunately, over time. And uh, in the end, we had um, kind of two, two camps uh, with different opinions. The central problem is here, APIs are difficult. There are so many styles out there. 
And uh, often it's even uh, a fashion how to do it. Um, so for instance, even in the W3C for the web platform itself, uh, the overall recommendations change over time. So uh, this will, would be an item that we take um, to the interest group and then try to have yeah, more consensus uh, while gaining more experience actually hands-on implementing this. Good, um, let's have a look at the timeline. So uh, overall the efforts were now going on for almost five years. So uh, the first um, actual work in, in the W3C uh, started in 2014 with a workshop um, with quite some high interest. Uh, shortly after that, we started the interest group that then worked on defining uh, basically what should be the first building blocks and uh, also worked on a charter for the working group which then yeah, started end of 2016. Um, as you can see, the now bar is pretty close to the end of charter. And uh, yeah, we are currently in, in the wrapping up phase. So um, it's a lot of work uh, that we have to do at the moment. Um, our last face-to-face -face meeting was uh, end of January um, to mainly work on the test suite, so uh, something that you have to provide in W3C is a test report that shows that the uh, recommendation is basically implementable by two independent implementations and those yeah, work correctly according to, to the specification. Um, we have then prepared the supporting documents that are required, like an explainer to send it to the TAC, the technical advisory group of W3C, and uh, we are currently running the uh, wide review. So for everyone who is interested and uh, maybe even adopted this, so for instance, there is a collaboration with OCF, with 1M2M and so on, uh, have a look at these two URIs and uh, yeah, provide us with anything that you might have had on the back burner or yeah, thought uh, you will come back to us. Now would be the time because we have to, to close this soon. Uh, plan is to publish or transition to the so-called uh, candidate recommendation on the 9th of April, so basically in roughly two weeks. Um, that means it's a freeze then, and we then have to work on the test suite, so basically provide enough test results that show that this uh, document is, is uh, complete and sufficient to, to implement correctly. And then according to, to the process of W3C, um, there will be another transition uh, to the so-called proposed recommendation if we are successful by to show that everything is, is uh, quite right uh, on the 21st of May. And this would be an important uh, date for those people who have or work for companies or organizations that are active in the W3C. Please tell your AC rep that um, there is a new proposed recommendation, and if you support this work, that he should yeah, basically fill out uh, the, the questionnaire on this, this new documents. And <clears throat> yeah, from there, we hopefully then have the standards ready by end of June. Another announcement um, just before that is here, the second workshop on the W3C. So um, what's this about? Um, we had the last workshop about five years ago, um, back then to um, see what is the general interest of, of doing this kind of work in the W3C, so a more application-centric uh, standardization work on, on the Internet of Things. And uh, this workshop we want to use to, of course, disseminate our findings, um, basically what we have learned in this quite uh, diversified group that we had in the W3C and then also discuss the, the way forward, uh, meaning, um, yeah, what should the, the interest group be working on? How big should be the scope of the working group? And by then we will already have to have uh, charter proposals ready, and uh, but we will be able to discuss those uh, proposals at this workshop. If you're interested to participate, um, we have this call for participation. So this is um, a W3C process that, um, it's open to and free to participate at these workshops. However, you have to submit um, this uh, notion of interest, which is just um, yeah, an expression of interest. So you basically say, hey, I'm interested in this. Uh, can I please come? 
if you want to have some uh, stage time, so uh, participate in some of the panel discussions, uh, give a keynote or a presentation and so on, uh, then you have to pre uh, submit the one to five pages position paper. Um, also, if you have uh, yeah, good opinion on, on what should be done, uh, then this position paper would be the right format for you. Um, the submissions are handled through EasyChair, so those from the academic background should be uh, aware of this. Um, the deadline is unfortunately pretty soon, so the 15th of April. Um, I saw that there are some of the uh, announcement systems still say it's the 7th of April. If you find that, uh, always pick the latest date that you find on some official source. At the moment, it's the 15th of April. Uh, notifications would be then uh, end of April, and then there's another deadline for the actual registration um, to show up. More you can find under this link um, here for the call for participation. And that's it. Any questions, any comments? Okay. Everything's super clear. Thanks, Matthias. Okay, do we have now Michael online? Michael, can you hear us? Okay, seems we're not limited to the beginning to have these technical challenges today. Okay, it seems Michael is having a bit of challenges. Um, if things don't work out smoothly now, Christian, would you like to take your resource director replication first that we can give Michael some time to join? Um, sorry? Oh. Uh, hello, my name is Christian Amsus, and I'd like to present actually. Speak oh, closer, closer, closer. And I'd like to actually present uh, two documents here. Um, the first being a resource directory replication, which I was asked to take here from the um, restful constraint restful environments, because it is more of a document that looks at whether things can work without really prescribing 
what what needs to be done or um, without without building so much. And the second is a proposal that I have that um, takes what the first document shows can be done and builds something that I think will be very useful for a web of connected things that directly work with each other. Uh, so the first one I'm referring to is groundwork document here. Um, it, it just um, sets up sets out the the, the structure, so it, it um, describes some challenges in upscaling. What are the requirements, and what are patterns that can be used to have a resource directory that is not only a single thing that everything depends on, but a, a composition of several devices that together act as a, a larger one. I want, like the, the, the tri I'd not say trivial solution, but the, the first solution that comes to mind is having a single application under a single authority that um, has some kind of backend that more or less magically orchestrates things, and whenever the request comes in, um, all instances of that application refer to the shared database. But it turns out um, that due to the way that the resource directory is, is built, um, it is not necessary to have such a tight coupling. So you can have several resource directories that might, for example, be announced on a, that might all individually be found or that might be announced under a DNS name that resolves to different hosts or whichever setup you have. And a registration <laughs> happens at one device, uh, at, at one entry node. And when lookups happen, those lookups are more or less proxied across the, all the participating resource directory nodes, uh, whether that is eager caching or whether that is um, uh, whether data is distributed in another way. There's various possibilities depending on the on the particular requirements. So um, there is very little running code to back this, short of a very few very small examples. But the the rough findings of the document are that we can have resource directories that are distributed and tolerant for signal nodes to fail and still provide for lookups, still allow registrations and still have a, um, a way for registered devices to say that, to recognize that their registration on partner is just gone and they fail over to someone, something different. Different. Um, yeah, so that is what the first document says, sets out. Um, yeah, let's now talk about something else. Um, that is, how do we describe with which devices in another device talk? So let me very briefly sketch out a scenario where we are having a small device that talks to your cell phone and they are just finding each other in a local network and have an address to express that name, uh, that that relation, whether what the phone is looking at, but as soon as the um, as the phone leaves the network, for example, phase over to uh, to cellular net network, um, that name won't work anymore. So let's build a wish list. What do we want of names? Uh, so stable identifiers is something that's probably good because cool URIs don't change, and um, the URIs are what we are using in web linking. Um, they should probably also be URLs, so be, use, be usable to resolve um, that name into something that we can work with. And they should be able to um, set us up for end-to-end -end security. So um, if, I have an IP ad if I have an IP address, uh, no matter how stable that is, um, that won't tell me how I know how to trust um, whoever does that. And um, while we are at building a shopping list, um, I'd like that solution to work with constrained devices that don't even need to grow their code size in order to do that. Do that. Uh, turns out we can do that. Um, so RDLink is a proposal that I have about um, a, an additional way of how we could address devices um, that in parts um, builds on resource directories conceptually, but is um, largely distrib distributed and decentralized system. So how could those those URIs look like? Um, well, if you're, you're probably familiar with the, the regular scheme, so uh, co-op plus AT is something that Core is working on to have a single scheme rather than one scheme for UDP and one scheme for TCP. And then we need to have something that is certainly a property of that device and the 
in my opinion, best thing for, for those things, as, especially if we can't rely on being part of any uh, centralized structure for, or hierarchical structure for that matter, is a cryptographic identifier. And that should be still usable in, um, for expressing a particular resource on that thing. So it works like a regular, like, like any other regular co-op URI and has a path component and can, you can do operations on that. Um, now, how do we how do we find such addresses? Because I mean, um, rdlink.r is not exactly something where would I would expect an, uh, quite a record to uh, quite a request to resolve. Um, those could either, in local scenarios, when maybe we don't even have an uplink, uh, be resolved using multicast. And in most um, for the internet case, those could be entered into a distributed hash table um, with some um, additional assertions that that the address that we are advertising is actually an address that is backed by whatever cryptographic identifier is in that address. Um, now, of course, we are talking about constraint devices here, so those will in all likelihood not participate in that DHD, um, but we can have helper nodes, and those helper nodes uh, would form something like a global resource directory that might not support everything that resource directory is set out to, especially kind of in-depth resource lookups will not work because it's, you can't just find everything on the internet. But it will look very much, very similar to resource directory and participate in all the protocol negotiation steps that a resource directory can participate in as well. So this, of course, it doesn't kind of uh, come from nothing. So I've looked at several other earlier approaches to the same, to the same uh, issue of of finding names for things that can be used. So um, the Tor project and their onion addresses are certainly a large influence. Um, I've looked at various others as well. I do not claim to have read through all of that. Um, in particular, the uh, um, probably 30-ish um, RFCs on HIP. Um, but those are all things from which we could, from which I'd like to learn and take lessons. And much of that has already gone into the design I'm presenting here. Um, so from the idea, how do we get up forward? Um, one thing is um, this relies on, on working core. So there are two, um, two, two kind of building blocks that, are, that still need to be um, fleshed out. Uh, next step for me would be to, um, to, to, write some, to do some prototyping and to, to get actually running code. And um, then to answer questions of operations. So right now I'm having an, a dot opera address in there. I think I haven't even um, entered something into an IANA registry yet. And um, having a dot opera domain is uh, using a dot opera domain is definitely a step up from that. Um, so one question is for, for me that I will need to um, answer in the course of this is um, how will that work in particular? But also something that we're, where I hope to get um, feedback from a research group is. Um, who else would participate in that? So uh, how, how could that be spread out? Because this will, if it is to succeed, this will need to be a, an effort that is distributed among, among um, several parties. Um, the goal I'm having with that is that I would like to um, run this with off-the-shelf um, devices by 2023. Now, I am aware that this is ambitious, but I think that if the people that might use this um, work together, this is something that can be achieved. Um, which brings me to the last step on that, that is my, my questions to the to research group. Or um, So I would love to gather uh, fee general feedback and ideas what this can, mistakes I made, um, things that things I did not consider, also things that, I, that someone else might have solved. An interesting question, especially with respect to also to the chairs, and um, is that is this at all the right place? Um, so I'm standing here because basically um, resource directory replication moved here, and I think this is a good place because this is definitely something experimental. Um, but I might be wrong. But the most important purpose of this presentation is to to gather you in. So, do you have requirements for for similar applications? Do you want to use that? Um, do you want to participate in that? And I hope that there are a few yeses. And 
I'd like to hear about that. Oops. Did I just go off the slides or? You fell off the edge. You're now oh. in the abyss. <laughs> Hello, uh, Bill here from Tampere University. Um, I can start with the, the first part of the presentation, which is about the, uh, the resource directory replication. And I, I think this is work that should have been started a long time ago because this is actually a really pertinent problem. Um, we need that replication in many places and in many use cases. And I've, I've seen this uh, being applied in various industries that um, without replication, we find extremely weird implementations where suddenly a resource directory becomes a co-op server and then they put a client inside it and then try to um, do registrations to a, a different resource directory and so on. So I think that's, that's, that's really good and I hope that that work goes forward. Uh, and then the uh, something completely different part. Um, that is interesting. I, I'm obviously very keen on the protocol negotiation as well as the F4 plus AT. So uh, I, I'd like to discuss this more offline with you. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to um, look through this draft before today, but but I think I like the ideas what you have proposed, and especially the prior art is uh, it's 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 there. I think there are some things that we can also look outside this uh, prior art. For example, OCF has a similar scheme that we could resolve. Yeah. So we we could talk about that a bit later. Yeah. Thank you. So, Eric, not Mark. So, I didn't catch. So, in the case of the global, you know, resource directory, yeah. uh, be it a DHT or anything else. So, what are the thoughts about sort of having some level of control about who can see what information? Sure, these are basically hashes, but still, I might only want to expose it yeah. to my company or my family or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so there's um, there are three answers that I have to this. Uh, first is that um, when it comes to things that the device tells about itself, which usually in a resource directory registration are all my different resources, those would probably be alighted by most devices, which is okay with the resource directory. Uh, now the second is um, what do I know of this head? What can I know of this hash? And I've talked to people from the Troll project and with their version three identifiers, they have a very interesting concept which basically encrypts the entries to the distributed hash table with the names themselves. So only someone who know who has been given that name is at all be able to look anything up about that. Um, and the third part that I see. So that, so, so that name is a character string name. Some yeah, so that name, name that name is looks looks like a Tor address. So that is 60-ish characters of base 32 encoded parts that are from from a authority component under a well known um, a well known domain and the third part is about um, restricting control with respect to um, to organizations now there um first um this does not um, by itself um, expose the devices um, from the network so if your device is unreachable from the outside, unless the device asks someone outside to proxy for it, um, it will start, still not be reachable. It can opt to proxy, but it will usually not. And the other thing is that um, those um, helper nodes, um, you cannot only, um, you, you do, not, do not need to rely on any existing network there. So you can just as well have in your, at the say border of your company, um, run one of those nodes yourself at the, at the well-known address. Um, like implement that any cast address yourself, um, participate in all the steps. But if you say that um, your nodes should not be announced to the outside, but should be announced within your organization, or you want to be able to reach outside uh, nodes, you can do that at that point. So I think you convinced me that the most you can do is sort of count how many people are you sitting behind some set of some IP address prefix. I can count um, them. If I had access to the whole DHG, I can count yeah. saying this is a big organization because they have a million of these things as opposed to three. Um, yes, you can make guesses on that. Although I've looked into um, even even hiding your position there when you're running one of those more advanced um, 
help or no. So you could you could do even more, but that's like um, probably one of the next or next. Yeah, if you have a key there, you could actually decide that I'm going to encrypt the information that's in the DHC node as well. So yeah. What, what I was trying to say is that um, you could even have your helper hide everything that is running on your network behind a Tor hidden service if you're so inclined. Okay, thank you, Christian. And uh, regarding your question to the, to the chairs, yeah, this <laughs> definitely sounds very explorative. So, uh, and if there is interest in the group, then I think this is certainly the right place to to look into this. So, and I, based what I see so far, it does look at this initial interest, so seems worth exploring deeper. Thank you. Um, maybe it could add, uh, the hobby discussion that, that comes up again and again is that um, we are putting these IoT devices into jails now, and uh, we need to find ways to, to plumb between these jails. And the directory infrastructure might actually help us do that. Uh, but of course, it would have to, to operate the doors of those jails. And, and, and uh, so the, the, there are some interesting questions of what, what exactly a directory uh, can do in this space. But it, it goes beyond just, just having an uh, IP address of something. Uh, you need to operate more machinery to actually be able to, to start to talk to the node. I'm not sure I follow all of that, but I hope we can follow up on that. Thank you. So yeah. we seem to have uh, Michael on, on the uh, mute echo now. Michael, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I, I wasn't, the, the tool tips on this thing have changed and now it's hard to tell what does what. How do I go into presentation mode? Can you give me a hint? Is there a well, I'm, showing you, I'm showing you slides. How about oh, that? Oh, okay. So if you show my slides, then I don't need to present. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, I'll just uh, I'll just start. So um, yeah, this is going to be about the uh, status and, and things that are happening around IoT extensions for Schema.org. We used to call this IoT Schema.org, but um, we aren't probably aren't going to have a subdomain, uh, as you see from the presentation. We're likely to integrate directly. So, next slide, please. Yes. Okay. So, um, briefly, we formed a community group, but it's still not active. The, the plan is to do most of this work in a in a W three C community group for the extensions. Um, but, but we haven't actually spun that up yet. It's formed and people have joined and more people can join, but we're not really uh, um, using it yet. The next step, as you'll see, is to, to engage that. And I want to talk about um, how we're going to integrate IoT extensions into schema.org. And then a, a thing that's recently come up, um, this is called One Data Model. It's an industry initiative that is um, very closely aligned. So um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, would you move forward to the a few slides to the schema.org integration proposal part? I'd like to go through that first. Yeah, that one. Okay, so what we're planning on doing is contribute to schema.org based on the prototype definitions that we, we have, which are capabilities and interaction affordances and events, actions and properties and data items. And we'll probably, you know, need to rename those to prevent name conflicts and to come up with names for those that uh, that everyone likes, but some some a few simple relation types like um, a capability provides an interaction pattern and uh, provides output data, and that can be used, of course, standalone. Other things could provide output data. Um, data item constraints are already there in property value constraints, and we want to add some property types for features of interest. So we can say, for example, that this temperature sensor is measuring the oil temperature of an automobile, and the, the oil is a feature of interest, and um, doing that linkage allows the, the semantic um, client to be able to uh, understand what they're doing. So the definitions themselves, when we say here's a thermostat, here's a, a light bulb, here's a capability to turn something on and off, here's a capability to set the level of something, those might not be in the IoT, they won't be in the schema.org core definition model. They'll likely be in external namespaces. So um, the, the idea is to just integrate the, the basic core um, property types and object types and then let the 
uh, people who want to define things use their own namespace. And this is a, a pattern that we're also seeing in this uh, one data model. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So what this is, is uh, basically just a, a description of what we're doing. This is basically the core model right here. This, this is really the part we want to add to schema.org. And the next slide. And uh, along with the extensions for feature of interest. So this is basically <clears throat> basically the model that we've been developing over the last couple of years of, of uh, collaboration in schema.org and IoT schema in the extension group. And this is really what we've come up with. So it has the core the core schema, uh, properties, actions, events, interaction patterns, and then feature of interest linkage. So this this allows us to pretty much say, go tell me the temperature of the, um, you know, heat exchanger tube side um, outlet, for example. And all those features of interest that are in, uh, say, brick schema can be combined with the definitions of uh, sensing and actuation that we have here and, and have a whole semantic um, identifier. Somebody's going to the mic? No, somebody's talking into the room. Okay. Then uh, next slide, please. I think we're, yeah. Okay. So the plan is to basically create GitHub issues and drive discussion in our collab organization and in the community group. And uh, at some point when we know exactly what we want to contribute, we will go and create issues on the schema.org and engage them and start the debate <laughs> and discussion about, um, you know, how to add this stuff to schema.org. All right, so um, now I, I think it's a good time to go back. And now that, now that I've reminded everyone what the core model looks like, let's go back and look at one data model stuff. Okay, so the proposal is to basically, um, so one data model is a bunch of uh, SDOs and, men, and and vendors. So it's Zigbee, OCF, um, GSMA, um, uh, OMA with lightweight M2M, and Google and SmartThings and Amazon and Comcast. And basically, um, it's to create a high-level semantic model that does not require a particular protocol implementation. So it's, it's essentially the same. Um, same mission that we took on in the schema.org extensions. And what it turns out is that we're probably going to converge on the same patterns. And uh, the alignment is uncanny uh, in terms of how, how um, well, it's, 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 I guess the work we've done is held up pretty well because it's just, it seems like that this is the same, the same conclusions are being made in this group. Uh, I'm currently at the first face-to-face -face meeting of this group and uh, already made proposals of the nature that are, well, the proposals are, are in the link here in, the, in my GitHub. Um, basically, it's, it's a high level semantic model with protocol bindings. And it says that, um, for example, you can, um, you can turn a light on or off or measure a temperature or set a set point um, and do that based on the abstract high level model in the application and then the system will be able to sort of select the protocol bindings and figure out, you know, uh, from the protocol binding that you need to go do a post at this particular address and and uh, what the format should be uh, uh, and what the data types are and this sort of thing. So let's look at a couple of examples. I've got some of that I, that I pulled out here. Uh, next slide, please. So oh, the UML model, okay, this is just a repeating what we already said. There's a thing and it has capabilities and they have interaction affordances, which can be events, action properties. And then there's some data types. And the data typing is uh, for the range and the uh, range units, um, things like that, and what's in the enum, et cetera. Okay, next slide, please. So um, I'm just gonna blow through these and not go line by line, but here it's describing a switch and a switch level capability, which is an on off and a dimming capability. And basically it says that for a switch, I have a, a value property and an on and off actions. And for the level property, I have a level property and a set level action, really simple. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah, so then the, those things linked, just here are some of the things they link to. So remember, um, I guess I explain a little bit, this is, uh, essentially JSON LD, which is JSON with some RDF hooks that allow you to do namespaces and um, 
URIs and things like that. So when we say add ID, that means that this thing is a, a meant to be linkable from externally. This is a URI. It's defining where this thing is in the uh, in the data space by URI. So the switch level dot level property, that's a thing that I can refer to from another file, right? And it says that a level property ha is a subclass of affordance and it has switch level data, it has a data item. And the same, the set level action is, a, is also an interaction affordance, it's an action type and it has level data and rate data. So basically with this information, the, the application knows what, you know, what, what kind of, um, data items and, and uh, are available. And then uh, next slide, please. And the data items themselves are defined in yet another place. Again, each one has an ID, so it's linkable. And uh, it says that the switch value data in this case consists of a string enumeration with the terms on and off um, in lowercase in English language, for example. It could be a Boolean, it could be one and zero, it could be a lot of different things. And so the idea is to be able to represent exactly what this um, this existing device does, which is a well, it's not really a device; it's a smart things uh, um, pseudo device that that you uh, have access to in the cloud. But it, it, it's just basically a um, what you might call a shadow or a mirror. So it, uh, the data items that we're using here are value data. That's the on off the level data, which is a an integer from zero to one hundred, and uh, rate data, which is a an integer from zero to sixty five five thirty five. So now the now the application knows you know, what, what it can do, it, it knows sort of what the data items uh, are needed and it, and it knows how to, can, how to form those data items. And this is all the definition that we're doing at, uh, at this level. The next level, we're taking these, and, uh, these terms like switch value data and level data and putting them to a protocol binding. So next, next page, please. Yeah, so here's an example of a protocol binding. This is a fragment of a Swagger file, an OAS 2.0. And it says this, this um, resource has a path. This is the path of the resource and uh, it has get and post operations. And what we've done is added annotations to say uh, at type, which means that the semantic type uh, sort of tags these things. So what you know is that this URI exposes a value property and it's also where you go to do an on action and an off action. And then when you look at the, uh, the verbs, the get, uh, get says this is, this is how you, um, you access the value property. This is how you interact with it on a read. And post is sort of, this is how you interact with it on a write. And post is also used to invoke the actions. So the idea is this protocol binding, um, the, the client already knows how to, how to look through the swagger and figure out how to, how to create a request, but it doesn't really know what they do. And so this basically adds information about what these requests do and, and how to do the different things. Um, next slide, please. And the last, um, the last thing is it says the data. So when I want to send the value, and this is basically in the in the swagger part that says um, describes the values. It says it's a boolean, which actually doesn't really match up with the the other example. But let's just pretend that the other example said boolean, because this is OCF now. Um, so it says that there there are some types here. That's a value data, an on value data, and off value data. And so what this means is that if I look at the on and say I want to switch this on, it means that I have to put a Boolean true in, and if I switch it off, I have to put a Boolean false in. And this is all the annotation for what data values you need. And then the, the value data just gives a schema constraints like um, 0 to 256 or, or whatever, right? So this is basically what we're proposing as the, um, as the way, the, the, what, what the one data model looks like as the uh, representation for this high level abstract model that all of these different SDOs um, and vendors can map their in existing models to. And um, this is really meant to facilitate eventual convergence around a single model that everyone uses. Right. Um, I think that's, I think that's about all. Let's see, what's the next slide look like? Are we going into the, yeah, okay. So we already talked about that. Um, going on ahead toward the end, and I think there's, there. Okay, so again, the schema.org, what we're planning on doing is um, working on the existing ontology until we get it ready to put into schema.org, and, and we need some broad agreement across a lot of different communities on what these are. Um, yeah, uh, and then we need to figure out how to make the definitions uh, 
how, how to make the navigation work on the definitions. So we have a web page you can go to read them. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so on the definitions, we're basically going to start creating these examples. Now Now that we have a format and tools and all that, we're, we're going to go forward and, and uh, you know, have, have uh, as many of these examples as we can. Um, and then in terms of tools, most of what we get requests for are to, to make this easy for developers to use. So uh, the same thing is happening in one data model. So basically, we're looking at a best practices guideline and eventually some tools and scripts that allow the uh, developer to automate a lot of the, the redundant parts of that. All right, so um, we're looking at... Um, hmm. Probably adding a few new classes like data typing and, and some some common thing types that, that and, and also enumeration. So we may be adding a little bit more to the ontology, but um, these are things that uh, that pro general problems in the industry that need to be solved, like what, what the enumerations for the fan mode of a thermostat and things like that. For example, we want to make those interoperable as well. Right. Um, next slide, please. So we're, yeah, building the web interface, we probably need to use shapes constraints and, and do some um, navigation. And then we need to figure out if you go to schema.org, how do you get over to this other namespace and, and navigate these definitions? Is it one entry point or separate or whatever? We need to figure all that out. I think that's about it. There's probably one more slide. Yes. Yeah, feature of interest. Uh, so this is a thing where What's happened in the last couple of years is some folks that in the automotive domain using uh, Geneva VSS and the uh, building domain using Haystack have um, kind of decided to align with this, this sort of way of doing definitions and build feature of interest ontologies that are going to be compatible with um, schema.org and what we're doing. So they're calling it VSS schema and brick schema for automotive and, and buildings. And what we want to do is work with those folks that are defining those in, in Volkswagen and BMW and uh, other folks are doing the building stuff and uh, you know come up with some, some really good uh, feature of interest properties for linking features of interest into the definitions or vice versa. <clears throat> also that at the uh, at the W3C meeting last in Lyon, we came up with a, a, a number of other collaboration points with sensor data and geospatial data on the web. And uh, then we want to also explore collaboration through IIC with some for some industrial uh, definitions. So that's, um, I think that's all. Is there one more slide? No, no, that's it. <laughs> okay. So that's that's where we are. Um, the, you know, the big news is this one data model thing, which really is is in its early stages. But um, I'd say that the outlook is very good. That a lot of these SDOs and manufacturers can make some some agreements at this high level. So that's that's kind of the takeaway. Thank you, Michael. Um, is there anything you you want to report about what's going on where you are right now? Okay, so I'm I'm in Philadelphia at the first face-to-face -face meeting of the one data model. Um, I wouldn't even call it an organization. It's a, 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 a I don't even know. I guess I guess you call it an organization. But uh, we have a group of folks, and uh, we're we're getting together to sort of hash out some of the high-level details. <laughs> it's an oxymoron. Um, you know uh, how we're going to go about this, and it really, it really started off as a fairly low-level thing. That okay, there's a Zigbee model, there's an OCF model, there's a lightweight M to M model. How do we, do we just pick the best one? You know, what do we do? And through through the discussions that led up to this, we've kind of come come around to realizing that we need we need we need to do something like capabilities, events, actions, and properties. And everyone now agrees that we really want it decoupled. So what we're doing this week is basically working through some of the actual examples and you know nailing down some of the decisions. Um, we we had a really good day yesterday of, of pretty much agreeing on what the core model is going to look like and what where the bounds are. And now we're down to okay, what if we need to? How do we compose things? What are the limits of what we can compose? Uh, we're down to talking about what the license is like for different STOs that contribute things that already have licenses. So um, I think we're, we're, we're down into the, uh, 
the uh, architecture discussion, and uh, this afternoon we're going to try to build some representative samples. So, and I've made some proposals about, uh, you know, like this this earlier thing that we earlier slides we saw uh, of of how we could use JSON LD with namespaces and and all of that as a common definition format and. Uh, no one else has proposed any alternates, so it, it looks like we, we may be able to um, go forward with a lot of, uh, without a lot of um, arguing about what the format should look like. We'll see. Anyway, this afternoon is is the concluding quarter of the meeting. We've met all day yesterday, and we're meeting today. And this afternoon, we're going to work through some examples. There, question from the mic. Hi, it's Eve. Um, yeah. I am curious to know. Who's not at the meeting that you're going to need to reach out to and draw into the discussion? We'd really uh, like to see Apple at the table. <laughs> yeah. In addition to maybe companies, um, are there other organizations in the IoT space that, or you know, general, uh, what, an interesting segment, whether it's automotive or whatever, um, that you need to to bring in to, you know, endorse as well? That's that's a really good question and. Um, I think what we're what we're looking at is we probably want to enable domain experts to create these definitions and not just pull things from exist, existing SDOs. So um, we want to get people who are more, well, domain experts. Like the the uh, we mentioned with uh, IIC, for example. Um, we'd also like to get people that. Um, don't have liaison agreements. Currently, it's sort of working under a liaison agreement with, with uh, OCF and Zigbee and all of that, and we have some invited experts, but we really want to bring in people from IETF and IRTF as well and get more interaction there. And we have some people who are in, in both, like Ari and myself and, and, uh, and, and some others, but um, we really want to try to open it up a little bit. So I'd say in those two areas, get get the other representation from other SDOs and other people that are building definitions, including Apple, and also the the domain experts. Do you have suggestions on other other engagements we might want to do? No, not yet. But it would be great to see the full list of participants at some point. But it's an exciting um, initiative. So, yeah, we're, we'll look forward to your. Uh, your minutes, your notes, or whoever's notes. <laughs> I'm taking I'm taking notes, but we have other people taking minutes as well. So hopefully there'll be a good report. Awesome, thanks. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. So um, I'm not seeing anybody else queuing up for the microphone. So uh, I hope you have a successful meeting over there, and uh, looking forward to discussing it in more detail. Great, thanks. And one more thing, if, if anyone wants to participate, we have a way of inviting experts. We have an invited expert kind of um, um, category that they obviously won't be able to participate in some of the, uh, if we go into any NDA space, but my, I'm, my hoping we never have to do that. We try to keep it all open. So please let me know if you'd like to participate and I'll try to get an invitation for you. Okay, can, can I queue up for that? Um, okay. You're on the list already. You should be getting an invitation soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, thank you. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, we are done with this item, and the only item that's left on the agenda, the only large item, is uh, Klaus telling us uh, about using Coral to bring more hypermedia to IoT. Now, one, one uh, problem maybe in, in uh, preparing this segment is that uh, one or two uh, of the, the thing to think research group summary meetings ago, I gave a quick uh, tutorial about what Coral is. And uh, uh, maybe we should put a link to that tutorial because it's recorded yeah, on YouTube. Hello, Michael. Can, can you turn down your microphone, please? Hello? I think it's gone. Thank you. Um, so maybe we should uh, provide a link to, to that tutorial, which is uh, recorded on, on YouTube, if you want uh, to have a little bit more detail on, on how Coral uh, works. And uh, this segment here really is about 
looking at, at the, the larger world of, of how you can build uh, applications uh, in, in a restful, hypermedia-oriented uh, way and uh, uh, talk about the, the place that Coral has in, in this world. So let's hand over to Klaus. Thank you. Um, so Ari already talked a bit earlier in this meeting about uh, what we did at the hackathon. And um, I have a few slides um, just to provide a bit more background on, on what we did. Uh, what we did there. And um, then I guess it would be a good opportunity to take some time to for discussion and next steps. and how we might want to move forward with this. And I don't have slides for that. Um, but before I come to, to the hackathon um, things, I want to briefly talk about um, hypermedia, in the ITF and IRTF in general. So this idea of using hypermedia for interactions where there's not a human in front of a screen clicking on links uh, and looking at funny pictures but uh, using it um, to drive the interactions between machines has been around for a while. And on several occasions, people have come up with some kind of um, hypermedia format, usually based on JSON, um, that they propose for, for driving these machine-to-machine -machine interactions in some way. And a surprising number of those um, have been published as uh, internet drafts. So none of them uh, of these uh, often called hypertext application languages, um, have made it to a working group document status so far. Um, but as the number keeps increasing over time, it shows there is some potential here. And there's also some need for standardization because essentially all of these formats are almost doing the same thing, but slightly different. Um, so a bit older is um, the hypertext application language, how um, more recent is JSON Hyperschema, um, which has the interesting approach of not putting the hypermedia on the wire, but instead augmenting existing JSON documents with hypermedia controls that then tell you how you can interact with the service based on this data. Um, very recent is the profiled hypertext application language, uh, with, which is unrelated to HAL. And uh, my proposal is Coral. And for a while, um, there has been this HTTP link header field, which also falls into the category of providing machine readable and machine understandable hyperlinks for navigating and interacting with um, HTTP based applications. And in the core working group, um, we have the link format that is now showing a bit of its age. Um, so we are thinking of uh, maybe replacing that with Coral at some point. And uh, right now, the, the primary use case for link format is this well-known core resource where you can ask a server, please tell me what resources do you have? And uh, Mark Nottingham has a related draft um, for HTTP, uh, which he calls the home document, where you can ask the server, please give me your home document, which is the, the entry point to your server. Um, so, Coral um, is yet another uh, hypermedia format uh, intended for these machine-to-machine uh, -machine interactions. And it does define a data model, um, which consists of links, which allow you to navigate between resources and forms um, taken from the concept of HTML forms, um, which allow you yeah. to make submissions, essentially, to the server. And uh, that's uh, enriched with the um, metadata about the resources that I mentioned so that a machine can decide um, which links are relevant to me based on some kind of vocabulary that I know uh, and how can I make some requests. And Coral comes uh, with two serialization formats. The primary one is based on CBOR and it's a very compact binary format. It's suitable for um, constrained environments. And um, it 
that's um, the, the biggest difference to the other um, hypermedia formats I showed on the previous slides, because those are mainly targeted um, at the big web and not at constrained environments where every, big, um, every byte counts. Um, it turns out that this binary format is so compact um, that you almost only can look at it as a hex dump. Or, um, that's not very useful for humans. So there's also um, a text-based format for Coral um, that we mostly use um, for writing down examples. Um, and then that would get compressed into the binary format. And um, if I had to summarize Coral in, in three sentences, um, I would describe it as it gives you a description of what is the resource that you're currently looking at, what can you do with that resource, and how does the resource relate to other resources. And how that looks like um, in this text format is shown on the next couple of slides. Um, so one example um, that has been uh, used for a while is Karsten's coffee machine. Um, it's still a not very well-defined example, but the intention is um, to create some showcase for uh, different data models or interaction models and try to see how that works out. And one concrete instance of that um, was presented as part of this Splot data model uh, in Rishi. And I took that example and um, tried to convert it to Coral. And um, what you now can see here is, I, I won't go to, into the details, um, but roughly um, it provides a bunch of um, metadata about a resource, a co-op resource that describes the coffee machine itself. itself. And um, it, it describes a bit about the current state of the coffee machine. It's currently brewing something. It's making progress. Um, and it has some limits of um, how many orders can be queued up. And um, then there's essentially a queue of uh, coffee orders that the machine will produce one after the other. And embedded in there um, is a form, a create form that instructs a client how to cr um, create co-op requests for um, adding new orders to the end of the queue. And um, then there are some forms for um, canceling uh, uh, some coffee order or pausing and unpausing it. Um, then we had one example um, where we had a W3C thing description. Um, and I called it Michael's light switch because um, it's very similar to what we just saw on, on Michael's slides with the IoT schema org update. And um, here it's not using a made-up example of coffee machine vocabulary, but the existing IoT schema org ex um, vocabulary, at least as much as, as, as much as possible. And um, this is um, a good example for showing this, what is it, what operations can it do, how does it relate to other resources. Um, we, we can see here that um, this light switch is a light, a binary switch, and a level in IoT schema terms. Um, what can you do with it? Um, you can switch it on and switch it off. So it has a switch state, um, which you can change. And it also has a level that you can change. Um, the um, thing description that I used um, to write this is shown on the left hand side in a tiny tiny font and that's because the thing description is very long um, which makes a lot of sense because the thing description does more than um, coral um, it has um, this uh, grouping into properties actions and events which coral doesn't have and, and then it has a protocol agnostic part for each um, possible interaction form and then the protocol binding um, that tells you how to how, how it's mapped to the specific protocol. So th that turns out to be a bit longer. But if you just make the assumption, for example, that you are using co-op, and then it collapses very nicely and, and very little information and can be expressed nicely in Coral. Um, then 
uh, this slide, um, you're not supposed to read this, but um, I went to the OMA slash IPSO um, definition of reusable resources. So they have um, these definitions of um, resources that can be used in, in, inside of IPSO objects. And I tried to extract this list of resources and I gave each one a, a name that can be used in Coral. So um, this could be a first step for expressing IPSO structures uh, um, using Coral. So you, you could ask an IPSO implementing device, what, what resources do you have? And it could answer using Coral. Um, of course, one of the use cases um, is also this well-known core resource where we currently use a link format in core to describe the resources um, of a constraint device. And um, there's one nice example in RFC 6690, um, which describes a bunch of resources, a sensors resource, a temperature resource, and the light resource. And it uses these features like resource type that we have defined in core and interface type and it also uses um, some of the IANA registered link relation types that you can find uh, in some RFCs. So this we also can do with Coral. And um, as Ari said, the, the conclusion so far, at least at the hackathon, was it works. Um, so. I guess a useful next step would be to do a bit of more experimentation um, to find out where else we can apply it. Um, earlier today, we discussed about this um, use case of group discovery using resource directories, which where they use the link format right now. And they stumbled, for example, on the problem of extending link format with the new link target attributes. And that's the, one of the parts where link format is showing its age and which could be very elegantly solved um, using Coral because Coral has these um, um, extensibility mechanism built in from the start. Um, so a, a bit of more experimentation would be useful and that's where you come in. Um, if you have ideas or use cases where you would be interested to find out um, if uh, that could if Coral could solve some problems there, um, it would be very nice to hear of that. Um, but so that, somewhat independent of that, um, we also now have a bunch of um, specifications, one for Coral itself and some details, and uh, a couple for uh, essentially showcases of Coral. And um, these, uh, at least the Coral document itself um, is quickly stabilizing, and I guess um, it would make sense to now look for a home in some working group for it. And the question is, how do we do that? So you said you, you said you were collecting links to to other things using Coral tools using Coral is. That on that screen right now, or is the, that in a different place? Um, I don't have a slide for that, but um, if you go to this GitHub repository, which is the last link on the slide, um, you can find some of the implementations that uh, were created during the hackathon, for example. And um, the GitHub repository also contains a bunch of examples and the ABNF grammar and CDDL and so on. a bit like this. Okay, and there we would uh, find things like, there we would find things like uh, implementations and uh, other material uh, we could use. And I should probably point to the side meeting that we're going to have tomorrow from three to five in room, room uh, Tiroka. Any questions right now? 
Any comments on your favorite hypermedia format? <laughs> it works. So yeah, for the record, there's some thumbs up from the audience, <laughs> from Christian. So uh, yeah, yeah, maybe for, for everyone, I, I am, my personal experience with was, was Coral was like when I first started, it took a while to get my head around it. But then more and more I started to actually understand it, the more useful and cool it actually started to look like. So uh, I, I, I had a lot of fun over, over the weekend in, in the hackathon thinking about how we could be using and especially adding these semantics to Coral and how can we be modeling systems in a, in a slightly different way that we've been doing so far using more hypermedia also in, in the IoT space. So I can highly recommend having a closer look at that and there's the I guess we'll, we'll post the tutorial also somewhere more easy to access uh, if, if you think you would like need, need something like that to get started. And I think the Wednesday um, site meeting is going to be a very good opportunity too also to learn more about Coral and, and think about different ways we could, we could be using that. But definitely one of those interesting topics seems to have a lot of potential to do things in a different way and and it's going to be interesting to explore how far can we take it. So with that, I think we can give you meeting planning. You want to do meeting planning? <laughs> <laughs> do we? <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't. I don't want to take keep you away from your, from your dinner plans. Um, but for the meeting planning, so we showed in the beginning what's what's our tentative plan for now. Um, so you 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 can see see the list here. Uh, we will of course having this usual with the IETF uh, summary meetings, but these meetings usually are not the one where we're doing most of the work. It's mostly where we're you know reporting what we're doing elsewhere. Uh, so highly recommend you to join, for example, the wishy calls in, if you're interested in the hypermedia semantics topics, or if you're interested in these various collaborations, we have other organizations, uh, we have those meetings coming, and we will be posting all of this information on, on, on the mailing list. And then in particular, the, the last point, that as, as I mentioned, like, um, we're very interested on, on having a collaborated event uh, with academia this year, next year, but in, in any way, doing a bit more of that than what we have done before. So if you have ideas on, on good venues, good locations, good Good ways to do that. Um, please talk to us, chairs. Okay, so with that, if there's no further questions or comments, thank you everyone for joining and hope to see many of you tomorrow in the, the site meeting and of course the rest of the week in the various IoT meetings. Thank you. And if you haven't signed the blue sheets yet, there's at least one blue sheet here in the front of the room.